In this video, I'm going to share with you my new updated list of the supplements that I'm taking. And I'll also cover other questions related to diet, supplements, exercise, and blood work. The first question, where is your new updated supplement list that you said you're going to share with us? Yes, I've been talking about my new updated supplement list for a while and I actually published it last week. So you can get it, the full list of all the supplements and in the right dose at seamlun.co forward slash supplement dash list. But I'm going to break down some of the key supplements that I'm taking myself right now. And my goal is primarily longevity and anti-aging. I don't take supplements for any other reason. Like I don't take supplements for weight loss or muscle uh, growth uh, on a regular basis or cognition or nootropics, anything like that. But these are the supplements I'm taking on a daily basis. So glycine, 10 grams a day, most importantly for collagen synthesis, but glycine is also important for glutathione, creatine, and heme synthesis. So just a very, uh, you know, universal supplement almost uh, that I think is safe, well tolerated, and a lot of benefits. I don't take 10 grams of the powder glycine entirely. I'm getting also uh, some glycine from, for example, gelatin powder that I can add to my yogurt, or I can just make gelatin desserts out of it. So you just use the gelatin powder, make jello and add like some berries or something like that, it tastes pretty good, very low calorie and pretty high in glycine. Next, collagen peptides. So I take this because there's you know several human clinical trials that show it helps with uh, skin rejuvenation or reduces wrinkles and helps with skin elasticity. So collagen goes down in your skin starting in your 20s already and uh, you don't want to like play catch up and collagen peptides in human clinical trials have also been shown to help with cardiometabolic risk factors. So um, it goes beyond just the skin uh, side. Next, omega-3 is 2 to 3 grams a day. I'm taking the dose of 2 to 3 grams because I'm trying to increase my omega-3 index, which is you know an objective biomarker that you can track. And uh, a higher omega-3 index over 8%, uh, which uh, looks at the amount of EPA and DHA in your red blood cells, uh, that is associated with reduced neurodegeneration, reduced heart disease, and reduced all-cause mortality. So I'm trying to get my omega-3 index above 8%. So my current score is 9%, which is already in the lowest risk category. But I'm uh, trying to get my uh, index to 10 to 11% as of right now. It's hard to do it with just food, um, or it's much faster to do it with uh, some uh, supplements, omega-3 supplements. But uh, you can also do it with food if you just eat you know, only fish pretty much every day. Uh, so I'm not eating fish every day. I'm eating it quite often, but not every day. So I'm just uh, supplementing with the two to three grams of omega-3s. And uh, the thing with this uh, omega-3 index is that it changes. So the turnover of red blood cells is six months. So it takes six months to change or to see a change in your results. So the last time I did it was a few months ago. Got a score of 9%. I'm going to do it again in two months and um, uh, expecting you get like at least 10%, maybe even 11%, which is my goal uh, right now. So I'm like adjusting my dose based on uh, my omega-3 index. So I'm not taking more than that. And uh, I'm going to pro- maybe reduce the intake once I reach the proper uh, index that I want. Next, hyaluronic acid, 200 milligrams a day. And uh, this also has been shown to help with skin hydration and uh, skin elasticity in human trials. Astaxanthin, 6 to 12 milligrams a day. Recently added it to my stack because it also has clinical trials showing it helps with uh, skin anti-aging. And uh, there's also clinical trials that it helps with blood pressure, inflammation, uh, lipids. So the one of the unique effects of astaxanthin is that uh, it protects against UV radiation. So it's the summertime right now or we are heading into the summertime and uh, you know there's a lot more sunlight here in Estonia as well so I'm just uh, taking it as a skin protector (laughs) against uh, excess UV radiation and lastly TMG 1000 milligrams a day this I'm taking to lower my homocysteine which was slightly elevated so I'm trying to get that below as well and uh, this 1000 milligram dose it might not be enough (laughs) we'll see but I could even have to increase it up to two to three grams uh, per day but TMG has many other benefits as well so it supports methylation obviously but also helps with uh, exercise performance and these are the six supplements I'm taking right now I've obviously taken a lot more in the past and uh, this is the current supplement stack as of now I also have some supplements that I'm taking on and off so a few times a month or a quarter or a few times a year so I'm not taking these daily and uh, these aren't like in my regular routine so berberine one gram a day 
helps with lipids, blood sugar, inflammation, as well as uh, waist circumference. So if I'm trying to lose some weight or if I'm trying to get my blood sugar very low or lower, then uh, I'm taking some berberine. And like a larger dose of one gram, I've found to be more effective than just 400 milligrams, which is the regular dose. Creatine, three grams a day. So the reason I, t- I don't take creatine all the time is because it uh, has been found to reduce VO2 max, probably because of increasing water uh, weight or just increasing muscle mass, <laughs> for example. So if you just have too much mass, then your VO2 max would slightly be lower. So I'm not trying to maximize muscle strength and muscle growth right now. I'm mostly focusing right now on VO2 max. So I'm trying to get that <laughs> even higher as well. So I'm not taking creatine for that reason right now. Boron, three grams a day, that's going to be for reducing sex hormone binding globulin which then increases free testosterone also good for uh, bone mineralization but my testosterone is fine right now so i don't need to take it in this moment hmb calcium three grams a day so this i usually take in a faster state if i'm trying to preserve as much muscle tissue and muscle strength uh, in so doing and uh, the human studies on hmb have found that it generally works if you're like an elderly person or if you're suffering from sarcopenia because it reduces then the muscle catabolism but it doesn't work in other cases so i take it in a faster state in the morning if i am trying to preserve muscle but uh, that's not my goal right now or at least i'm getting enough protein and calories as of now that my muscle mass isn't in danger of being catabolized so i don't have anything to gain from hmb right now but if i were in a severe calorie deficit or if i were to do more fasting or if I were to try to maximize muscle strength then I would take this one vitamin d3 and k2 so this one I would take in the winter months when I'm uh, not getting exposed to that much sunlight so I'm trying to maintain good vitamin d levels and for that I'll just take a d3 uh, supplement niacinamide is a form of b3 vitamin b3 and it's one of the cheapest and a pretty effective NAD booster as well seed probiotic so this is uh, I think the best probiotic out there and uh, this is the only probiotic I actually take I don't take it all the time you know a few times a year I'll just do a short course and I do notice that this one works whereas the most other probiotics I I notice uh, no effects NMN and NR so again I might do them a few times a year not on a regular basis because I don't feel like I need to do them and uh, usually the biggest reason I would want to take NMN or NR is when I'm like exposed to some sort of sort of like circadian mismatch or a jet lag so it helps with circadian rhythm alignment in my opinion and helps with like steep deprivation aged garlic extract 2400 milligrams a day this one is beneficial for uh, lipids uh, blood pressure inflammation blood sugar so garlic is i think one of the most potent quote-unquote superfoods out there but uh, yeah like the aged garlic extract has human clinical trials as well showing benefits on lipids and other cardiometabolic risk factors so for heart health Uh, but again i'm not taking it uh, every day melatonin 0.3 milligrams a day so like a microdose melatonin every once in a while to uh yeah usually for the antioxidant benefits i don't need it for the sleep benefits i might take like a larger dose if i'm traveling or if i'm changing time zones to realign the uh, circadian rhythms but uh, for me a smaller dose usually works better than a larger dose like i just sleep better with a 0.3 milligram dose and one supplement that's missing from here is magnesium so i'll take it uh, as well for just making sure that i have optimal magnesium status and maybe sometimes it's useful for sleep or stress or relaxation or something like that but uh, it's not you know like a daily supplement stack so this is the list that i'm taking right now in the pdf that you can get for free from the link below uh, you will also find like the supplements that are evidence-based that I do think that work. There is evidence that they work, but I'm not taking them right now for, for, for reasons. And there's a list of supplements that don't work either. So like the supplements that I recommend against. So check it out from the link in the description. Interestingly, peptides could be the future of longevity supplements. One of the most evidence-based peptides for skin aging is copper peptide GHK. Copper is needed for collagen and elastin synthesis as well as collagen uptake into cells. Copper peptide GHK has been found to modulate skin regeneration and wound healing. In diabetic humans, GHK has been seen to speed up skin healing from ulcers by threefold. GHK copper peptide also modulates antioxidant genes that protect against inflammation, UVB radiation and oxidative stress. 
So copper peptide GHK helps with collagen synthesis, it helps with skin regeneration, wound healing and skin elasticity. I've been using the Alitura Gold Serum for over a year. The Gold Serum has GHK copper tripeptide that helps with skin regeneration, pigmentation and elasticity. There's also other amazing natural food grade ingredients like marine collagen, organic olive oil, plant retinol, astaxanthin, bee propolis, beeswax, CoQ10, essential oils and hemp seed oil, all of which support collagen synthesis and skin health. All Alitura skincare products are made of natural ingredients with no microplastics or hormone disruptors, unlike conventional brands. Their products are also bottled in Myron glass, free from xenoestrogens and plastics. This makes the gold serum the most unique and powerful skin serum you can use, and I'm personally taking it daily. There are hundreds of positive testimonials and reviews you can check out on the Alitura website for some amazing skin transformations. Use code SEAM for a 20% discount at alitura.com. Next question, what are the thoughts about studies on omega-3 supplements showing increased risk of arterial fibrillation and how real is that risk? So this is one of the biggest negative talking points against omega-3s uh, online. So it can, you know, even besides the lipid peroxidation and uh, inflammation part, uh, which again is still very... It's still there's limited evidence to suggest that that uh, the uh, omega-3 supplements would increase inflammation if anything then it's actually the opposite uh, that uh, most uh, most of the studies find that the omega-3s reduce inflammation but uh, the second biggest talking point uh, is going to be the arterial fibrillation so ar arrhythmias and uh, other cardiovascular complications so there is some uh, randomized controlled trials finding that but usually it's not it's not consistent it's not across the board there are some studies that do find an effect others don't but uh, the studies that do find effect usually are done with very large doses of omega 3s so 4 grams of omega 3s a day and they're also you know for usually the 4 grams of omega 3s are prescribed for people who have heart disease and they're at a high risk group so these people are already at an increased risk of atrial fibrillation and arrhythmias and other cardiovascular complications so I don't think it's like a very fair comparison in that sense because those people already are at a high risk and they're all, all also taking like a very high dose. So the high dose is what appears to be associated with the risk, whereas a low dose below 2 grams and below 4 grams generally isn't associated with that risk. So I don't think there's, for most people, anything to worry about unless they are taking a mega dose of omega-3s, which I think, you know, isn't a smart idea. But... Uh, and, and if they don't have like already pre-existing arterial fibrillation or a history of that or history of arrhythmias or other cardiovascular complications. So if you're clear from that, then taking like a more moderate dose is a fine and there's no evidence that it's going to increase the risk of this arterial fibrillation in otherwise healthy people as long as they're taking like, you know, normal dose. Uh, if you're taking like four grams for no reason, then, you know, it might increase the risk over time over the course of years but uh, again in uh, smaller doses there's there's no evidence that uh, it would do so and again like like i said earlier my current omega-3 dose is two to three grams and the reason i'm doing that is because i'm trying to aim for the omega-3 index of 10 to 11 percent and that's a objective biomarker that is associated with better health outcomes like there's studies finding that the higher omega-3 index is linked to lower heart disease and lower neurodegeneration. So you need to always also look at the totality of evidence, you know, not just uh, one study, for example. So I'm taking the two to three gram dose to uh, increase my omega-3 index right now. And then I'll uh, perhaps like reduce it to slightly lower. But again, I'm just in the short term trying to increase the index to uh, get into the 10 to 11 percent. Next question, can astaxanthin inhibit DHT and cause gynecomastia if you take 22 milligrams a day? <laughs> so that's an interesting and specific question. There is, uh, as the, there is studies finding astaxanthin inhibits DHT and it can increase testosterone levels as well. There's no uh, studies about astaxanthin affecting gynecomastia or reducing gynecomastia. You know, one theoretical or mechanistic effect could be that astaxanthin can in increase gynecomastia because if you have higher testosterone then that extra testosterone or elevated testosterone can be converted into estrogen so that's why in puberty some people some guys get gynecomastia because of puberty so in puberty you have you know massive amounts of testosterone or like a very large increase 
so that gets converted to estrogen and uh, but I think I don't think uh, the azaxanthin will raise your testosterone <laughs> that high that it gets converted to estrogen it's the effect size probably isn't that uh, that uh, significant so I don't think there's anything to worry that azaxanthin, azaxanthin would increase gynecomastia but there's no evidence that it would reduce it either if that makes sense it does inhibit DHT slightly which might some people might find useful for hair loss or something like that but uh, it also does increase testosterone although not in significant amounts that would be like increasing your risk of gynecomastia if that makes sense and 22 milligrams a day that's a pretty large dose I don't know what's the reason for this specific dose but for example in the other clinical trials where astaxanthin is used for you know the cardiometabolic health as well as skin aging then the dosage is usually 6 to 12 milligrams even 3 milligrams is found to be effective so 22 milligrams is definitely like um, overkill for at least the skin anti-aging and and like the lipid effects next question i have a bmi under 18 is it a problem for longevity so that's an interesting question like is having a bmi below 18 which is considered underweight and like almost like in the malnourished category usually it's associated with that is this going to be bad for longevity well in the epidemiological studies they find the u-shaped association with bmi and mortality risk so if your bmi is below 22 and above 25 then that's associated with increased risk and the lowest mortality can be somewhere between 25 to 22 uh, of bmi units but the thing is that a low bmi usually is explained by this reverse causation effect so people who have a very low bmi so below 22 they uh, might suffer from some uh, medical condition or some other thing that uh, increases that risk so they might be malnourished they might be anorexic they might have sarcopenia uh, they might uh, have some medical condition like cancer or heart disease or something else that just makes them go super low body weight or they might have some drug abuse disorder mental conditions and uh, alcohol disorders or something like that those can, those can explain the uh, reason why a low bmi is usually associated with increased mortality but the studies that do control for that the studies that control for this reverse causation effect they find that the lowest risk of mortality is still with a slightly lower bmi so a bmi between 18 to 22 is uh, found to be uh, still a very low risk of mortality and uh, the the increased the bmi below 18 is still associated with a slightly increased risk even if you uh, take into consideration the reverse causation potential and uh, the effect of that so uh, that could be just because if you are still very low body weight like a bmi below 18 then it could just mean that you're very frail or very low body weight or just malnourished so you need to make sure that you get enough of the micronutrients macronutrients and you need to make sure that you have enough bone density and uh, enough uh, muscle tissue as well so for that you can look at your like DEXA scan you do a DEXA scan you can get uh, your bone density measured if your bone density is you know below standard deviations so something like 0.5 standard deviations below normal for your age group or even more then that would be a red flag because if your bone density is low and your body weight is also low then uh, you're just at a high risk of frailty and sarcopenia and the same with muscle mass if your muscle mass is very low for your age group and your height then uh, that will be also like something to be concerned with because muscle tissue low muscle mass is associated with increased mortality as well especially the older you get maybe not in your 20s it's not going to be that big of a concern but in your 40s already it would start to increase the risk at least based on the studies so if you're very low bmi then just make sure you have high bone density high muscle mass and you're getting enough micronutrients and macronutrients and if you find that you have some red flags there then you just I, I, you would be better off by just increasing your bmi uh, slightly to get into a slightly higher body weight which would then increase your bone density and increase your muscle mass as well but the bmi again is not like a perfect unit at least in the middle of the bmi so if your bmi is something like 26 or something like that you're in the overweight category but because you have muscle you might be uh, fine so sometimes having too much muscle can skew the results of the bmi but not in the extremes if you get what i mean if your bmi is 30 or 18 
then uh, you're in this like extreme kind of uh, end of the spectrum that uh, in that scenario is more accurate or is more relevant. So if your BMI is over 30, then chances are you just have too much body fat, even if you think you have muscle tissue. <laughs> so my BMI is 25.5. I have abs, uh, you know, I'm very lean. And uh, I also have high bone density, like two standard deviations above normal for my age. So that's, you know, pretty high bone density, even for my age. So that's why my BMI is slightly elevated, but my body fat percentage and my waist circumference is super low. So th that doesn't inherently increase my risk of mortality. So the BMI in that scenario is less accurate because of these confounding variables. But if my BMI were to be 30 and I would have a, like a gut <laughs> or even if I have like muscle, I'm like a, you know, quote unquote fat power, power lifter, then, uh, then uh, it's, it's going to be worse. It's going to be still indicative of um, a poorer prognosis in the future because of uh, the extra body fat, even if you think you have muscle if that makes sense. And the same with uh, the extremely low body weight. If your BMI is 18, then chances are you are underweight and chances are you have lower bone density. Chances are you have lower muscle mass. So the more extreme the BMI is, the more accurate or more relevant it tends to be, in my opinion. There's no way someone who has a BMI 45 is like a lean bodybuilder or a lean uh, power lifter <laughs> because to get a bmi 45 you need to be obese pretty much and the same with a bmi 15 like there's no way you have normal bone density and normal muscle mass with a bmi 15 if that makes sense so you need to measure those things more importantly and you know some of the i'll outline some of the other markers that in addition to bmi is more important so like muscle mass bone density uh, waist, waist circumference and the waist to hip ratio if those are normal then a BMI of 18 inherently isn't bad. But uh, you need to look at them. And just relying on the BMI alone is not going to be enough. But because you're on the extreme end of the spectrum, then it's very likely that those other numbers are also off, if that makes sense. Next question, when is your next book coming? So, yes, my next book, The Longevity Leap, it's uh, scheduled to be released in June. And uh, I've you know talked a lot about it over the last few months already. Every once in a while, I've been writing it for eight months. It's just a heck of a lot, a lot of work, and I've been just uh, trying to make it as perfect as as possible. I'm going through like proofreading several times, uh, editing, making some adjustments, uh, making sure it's all like custom graphs. It's a uh, yeah, like it's a very solid and polished book, and it just takes a lot more time uh, to do it uh, that way, and it's hopefully coming out <laughs> or at least it's already proofread it's uh, getting through the final edits or final adjustments in terms of the formatting which uh, is not going to take that much time but it's gonna be released in uh, june next question what is the optimal running lifting workout split for stamina focus so for stamina focus endurance you know cardiorespiratory fitness doing cardio uh, for that focus you should still spend the majority of your training doing cardio so the sport specificity obviously is important if you're training for some whatever kind of a sport event cycling or swimming running you need to train that the most the most of your time should be spent training for that whatever event it is if you're training for general general stamina and general endurance general cardiorespiratory fitness then uh, you should still you know spend a lot of time doing that particular form of cardio and doing endurance work so um Combining that with uh, weightlifting is obviously important and beneficial for longevity purposes, and it can have like a complementary effect on your endurance. Uh, so, for example, if you have higher bone density from lifting weights, then you might get less joint pain from running long hours, and uh, vice versa. If you're, for example, doing only weights, then adding some cardio can improve your gym performance because you have better endurance and you can do more sets and more reps without getting gassed out. So you always want to do both. But, you know, you, you can adjust your focus for that particular season or stage of your life. So right now, my focus is slightly more on the cardio side. And I'm trying to get my VO2 max as high as possible. And uh, for that, I'm still doing weightlifting. Obviously, I'm doing it like three times a week. Uh, but I'm incorporating a lot more cardio. So what would be the most optimal endurance protocol? So just solely trying to maximize stamina and endurance. I think it would be like four times a week of zone two and uh, for like at least an hour. So the more zone two you do, the better it generally is for 
the uh, accumulation of these slow twitch muscle fibers and building your this base for your cardiovascular fitness, which lays the foundation to your endurance. So all the best endurance athletes in the world, they don't do a lot of intervals or they don't do a lot of weightlifting. They do a little bit of it, but like 80% of the time they do zone two, literally like the Tour de France cyclists, they do 80% of their training and they train obviously like, you know, over 10 hours probably like 14 15 hours per week even more maybe uh, and uh, most of that time is spent in zone two doing that kind of training because that's that's going to lay the foundation to your endurance and stamina by increasing the slow twitch uh, muscle fibers and then i would add like a one once per week uh, interval session so this four by four norwegian method or any other derivation uh, of that that will be enough uh, for the uh, high intensity interval training component and then like once a week for uh, weightlifting uh, that will be also enough for uh, so solely endurance and stamina focus so you can do like these uh, compound lifts barbell squats deadlifts bench press pull-ups i think that's all you pretty much need to uh, get the benefits uh, from uh, resistance training the thing with the uh, barbell squats is that if you're doing a lot of uh, leg endurance so if you're doing running and cycling then you're getting a lot of uh, stimulation for your legs as well and just doing barbell squats might put too much like strain or you you could just um, overreach with your legs by just doing too many barbell squats so you need to like okay if if i'm already doing a lot of cycling and stuff like that i probably don't need to do additional barbell squats Uh, so but you could still benefit from like deadlifts and uh, bench press for example so it depends on what type of endurance are you doing but you know the main focus should be still on that particular event that you're training for so if you want to get good in endurance then you need to do more more endurance <laughs> like you need to run for you know uh, hours and hours every week next question what's the best way for a 54 year old man to lose 10 kilograms diet supplements mainly thank you so the principles of weight loss are pretty pretty much the same for all age groups. It's the same for 20-year-olds and 80-year-olds. Obviously, the approach of how you get there or what kind of you know, routines you follow has to be adjusted for the age group and the individual. I don't think there is like no single gold standard diet or exercise program out there. You need to always find what suits you the best. But I can obviously outline you some of the main principles that I think you need to kind of focus on first of all in terms of diet you know to lose weight you need to be eating slightly less calories and you achieve that by reducing your calorie intake or increasing energy expenditure ideally both usually increasing exercise is going to be more suitable for most people because it's easier to move more than to eat less in my opinion (laughs) Um, but um, but there are literally like dozens of different diets that you can follow. You could do a carnivore diet, you could do a vegan diet, you can do a, if it fits your macros diet, you can do a paleo diet, uh, whatever diet it is. The diet is something that you just need to adhere to over the long term because you can't outrun or out exercise a bad diet for too long. You need a diet that satiates you and uh, enables you to be in a negative energy balance for the foreseeable future until you like reach your target goal and you know if you want to maintain the uh, the new body weight then you also need to adhere to it for a, a little bit longer as well so all the diets generally work through the same not necessarily like a mechanism but through the same effect which is increased satiety so for example a carnivore diet there is you know thousands of success stories of people who lose weight with a carnivore diet and the reason for that is because it's high in protein and the high protein and the high meat intake satiates them and they end up eating fewer calories. The same with a vegan diet. There's also thousands of success stories of people losing weight on a vegan diet. And the reason for that is because the vegan diet is usually higher in fiber. And uh, that higher fiber intake satiates the people. And uh, there's, you know, so many studies showing that a higher fiber intake does support weight loss and increases satiety signaling. So... The carnivore diet and the vegan diet are actually working through the same effect, which is increased satiety. It's just that on a vegan diet, it's the high fiber, and on a carnivore diet, it's the high protein that mediates the effect on the satiety and reduced hunger, reduced uh, energy intake. And the same applies to like it fits your if it fits your macros. Like uh, some people just want to have like whatever food they want as long as it fits into their daily calorie intake. And there's you know thousands of success stories as well with the eat fit feature macros approach 
So, you know, you can literally find any diet that works. Uh, or you just need to find a diet that works for you over the long term and what helps you to reach satiety and what reach what helps you to reach an energy deficit. Some of the key principles on a diet perspective is that you want to aim for a slightly higher protein intake because that helps with satiety and it also increases the thermic effect of food, which means you will be burning calories on digestion. So for protein, you want to aim for like 0.8 grams per pound of body weight, which is 1.6 grams per kilogram. And for most people, it's going to be like 100 to 150 grams of protein, depending on their body weight. So the slightly higher protein intake is going to be beneficial for fat loss and muscle maintenance and satiety. And then, at least in studies, like fiber is usually actually like more associated with weight loss because fiber is also lower in calories and pretty filling. So combining the fiber plus protein is usually the most satiating combo, in my opinion, at least. So that's why like a lot of the low-carb diets have a lot of success stories because they eat fiber and protein, and uh, that's why they lose uh, weight quite easily in so doing as well. So uh, what I like to do when I'm trying to lose weight would be uh, eat, eat more protein, eat more fiber, and then I'll add like some whole food carbs, uh, potatoes usually, in there as well because like actually the potato is very satiating like just individual foods if you look at individual foods then there are studies showing that the potato is the most satiating food just if you have to eat like one single food and there's some people doing like the potato diet where they lose weight by just eating potatoes might not be sustainable for years uh, to come but uh, you get the point that there's just so many different types of diets out there people have different preferences some people like to eat more fiber some people like to eat more potatoes some people like to eat more more meat they can all work so i think you shouldn't like like make your uh, diet decisions what other people tell you <laughs> if that makes sense if you like a certain food and it helps you to stick to a diet then that's going to that's that's going to work for you and that's the kind of idea behind the if it fits your macros at least to a certain extent that you eat whatever you want as long as it fits into your daily calorie intake Usually the if it fits your macros people still adhere to a certain daily targets. So they still hit their daily protein goal. They still hit their daily micronutrient goals. And they still hit their like daily like carbohydrate goals and fat goals. And then they fit the other in there. So it's more like 80% I'll eat the kind of uh, pristine and clean diet. And the 20% is going to be maybe like a Snickers bar, or whatever it is that they find satiating. So that's also like a pretty reasonable approach uh, because you're just like leaving some room for the things that you find enjoyable. Like maybe some people like a piece of dark chocolate, other people like uh, a glass of red wine, and that helps them to stick to the diet. You know, there's so many diets, there's so many people out there and there's so many uh, preferences. So one isn't inherently better or the other. The second part of the question is like supplements. To be honest, there's not a lot of supplements out there that like could have a significant effect on weight loss. If there were, then obviously most people would take it. You know, there is one supplement that I have used myself and have found to be effective for fat, uh, fat loss and that's uh, Yohimbine. But uh, your himbine is like this adrenergic and uh, this uh, cortisol increasing uh, plant that does increase your heart rate, increases your energy expenditure, and increases sweating and those kind of things. But I wouldn't use it like over a longer period of time because of those uh, reasons. Like it just increases your heart rate too much. It can keep you up at night. It can reduce your sleep quality. So I don't take your himbine on a regular basis, maybe like a few times a year if I'm really trying to lose weight or lose fat uh, at a faster pace but uh, I wouldn't recommend it to take it all the time because of this adrenergic uh, signaling it has and regular caffeine works through similar mechanisms so it increases your energy expenditure and increases like activity levels so uh, regular caffeine and coffee intake is associated with lower body weights and lower obesity lower diabetes as well and lower heart disease but uh, the caffeine powders, I, I would be probably more careful with those because, uh, yeah, it's very easy to overdose if you're taking like a pre-workout powder or some uh, other caffeine supplements. So I would, you know, I think uh, drinking coffee and teas are beneficial, like they help with weight loss by reducing hunger and increasing energy expenditure. But uh, the pre-workout supplements I would you know, probably not uh, use myself. Next question, can you take antioxidant just after waking up? 
or your risk to suppress normal cortisol spike. So antioxidant supplementation generally has uh, little, to, little to no effects on uh, cortisol levels. And uh, I think there's no real effects if you take like uh, antioxidants in the morning. It's not going to have any effects on your cortisol levels. But uh, from a circadian rhythm standpoint, the best time to take antioxidants does appear to be before bed because that's where your antioxidant levels or antioxidant activity with other hormones also peaks. So when you're sleeping, that's when you produce the most melatonin. Melatonin has a lot of antioxidant effects. It also regulates glutathione and other anti-inflammatory pathways. So it makes sense from a circadian rhythm standpoint that the best time to take antioxidants would be before bed. And, uh, you know, things like NAC, if I were to take them, then I would take them before bed, probably. Next question, are plant-based protein powders made from 8 plus protein types comparable to whey protein? What are the advantages and disadvantages over whey protein powder? So uh, if you look at gram for gram, then uh, the whey protein, egg white protein, other animal protein powders are more bioavailable. They have more essential amino acids and gram for gram, they result in greater protein synthesis and muscle growth. Uh, muscle hypertrophy response as well but that's you know if you look at it gram for gram (laughs) so the plant proteins have less essential amino acids which explains those uh, results and explains the lower protein synthesis response if you look at studies there are some studies that compare 30 grams of whey protein to 60 grams of wheat protein powder and they find that the 60 grams of wheat protein outperforms wheat protein uh, several hours later So that's because you're just getting double the dose of the protein powder from the wheat protein. So if you have 30 grams of whey versus 60 grams of wheat uh, protein, then the 60 grams is going to outperform whey because it's a larger dose. So uh, the, uh, the, the lower quality of plant proteins can be overcome or improved upon if you just take a larger dose. So if you just consume 20 to 50% more of the plant protein, then uh, you're going to get comparable results. It's just that, yeah, the whey protein is going to get the same effect at a lower dose, which doesn't mean that the plant protein wouldn't work, if that makes sense. Next question, where do you measure your biomarkers? What company? So right now, I'm measuring my biomarkers or blood markers, uh, you know, two to three times per year, and I'm doing them at the Iowa Clinic in India, where I'm organizing my retreats. And I'm going there two to three times per year right now, and I'm getting this 180 comprehensive blood panel that looks at 180 biomarkers and it's yeah pretty pretty awesome it's just you know what I'd like to see I'd like to see all the 180 (laughs) biomarkers it's there's no real reason to do it like you know more often than not that uh, most people would generally just be fine by looking at some of the key blood markers once a year so you just look at your lipids inflammation and white blood cells and uh, sex hormones once a year that's already good enough unless you change your routines dramatically or unless you're going through some health condition or unless you have lost a lot of weight or something like that and you want to see the improvements then there's no real reason to do the blood work you know any more than once a year in my opinion for most people Uh, i'm just doing it more often more comprehensively because of uh, you know, kind of, kind of doing it as a living, if that makes sense. Doing these different experiments, making content about it, and experimenting these things is uh, what I kind of need to do, and I enjoy it as well. But yeah, at the, to answer the question, I'm doing that at the Iowa clinic. In the past, before I went to the clinic, uh, I've done like regular blood panels at these uh, private clinics here in Estonia. Uh, I haven't ever gotten like a regular blood panel from my doctor because they say like you're healthy or young why do you want to do this so you're probably not going to get a blood panel from your doctor for like no reason (laughs) unless you have a health concern they're not going to give it to you so fortunately in here in Estonia there is some private clinics you can just go there get your get your blood drawn at a pretty uh, cheap price as well so this is what I would do before the uh, clinic in India but right now for the next few years I'll be doing it in the Iowa Clinic, so a few times a year, this uh, comprehensive blood panel. And if you want to join me, then uh, check out the link in the description. I'm going there several times a year. Next question. The aim is to live more, but is it not paradoxically the amount of time and resources that someone has to allocate to live longer, also wasting their life? So that's a reasonable question, obviously. You know, if you're spending hours on your health and longevity, trying to live longer, are you actually like just wasting your life and not living properly, if that makes sense? Well, it depends on the person and 
there's multiple you know answers to it. Some people like this. You know, Brian Johnson, he likes it. He enjoys it. I like it as well. I enjoy it. I like to exercise. I like to research and uh, write books about it and create content about it. And I like to eat healthy. I like to do those things. So I don't think it's a waste of time for me because the quality of my life is still higher as well. Like the quality of my life is significantly higher right now if I'm really taking care of my health versus if I were to be obese or something like that. (laughs) So you need to kind of think about, okay, what kind of life do you want to live? And if it's worth it for you. For me, it is worth it. Some other people like, oh, I can't go to parties or I can't drink alcohol it's not worth it for me, so therefore I'm not going to do it. Or it's not worth it for me to spend, you know, multiple hours at the gym or multiple hours doing cardio because it's not worth it for me. Well, for me, it is worth it because I also enjoy it and the the benefits I get outweigh the cost. So it doesn't even feel like I'm sacrificing anything because that's what I like to do. <laughs> that's what I think that's the goal. Like you need to do things that you enjoy. And if, if uh, being healthy and doing healthy things is what you enjoy, then I think that's a win-win, <laughs> so to say. Because you're enjoying the process while simultaneously extending your health span and extending your lifespan potentially in so doing as well. So it's a double win, <laughs> if that makes sense. Now, Brian Johnson also adds the caveat that he believes that we're at the verge of this uh, longevity escape velocity, which means that after a certain threshold, every year that it goes by, your life, ex- life expectancy increases by two years, because of advancements in medical technology. So you're just staying alive so long that all the science and medicine keeps you alive for longer for every year that has passed. So this is uh, an idea that he hasn't popularized. Obviously, it's been around for decades. And uh, there are many people who believe that I think we are heading in some direction like that. I don't think we're close enough to reach the actual longevity escape velocity maybe at least not in the next few decades but uh, what we do see is that uh, the average life expectancy does increase and uh, it does keep increasing and uh, the projections are that some of the longest living countries like South Korea and Switzerland their average life expectancy is going to be in the 90s by the end of this century so people on average are going to live into their 90s by the end of this century and uh, that means that a lot of people will live into their hundreds as well so i do think that that's what's going to happen just by virtue of people staying healthier and you know having a healthier lifestyle overall but uh, the longevity escape velocity that's also like a potential you know how how big of a life extension we're going to get from that who knows <laughs> uh, but uh, you know it's, it's, it's still like a worthwhile idea to keep in mind so like Brian Johnson thinks that okay I'm gonna be super disciplined and super uh, meticulous with my health for the next 10 years and uh, I'm gonna gain back 50 maybe 100 years of extra life after the longevity escape velocity arrives so that's also like I guess you know for him it's probably not a trade-off because he also enjoys it as as for me like i enjoy my health and i enjoy these uh, health routines and health optimization so i'm not losing anything in my opinion i'm not losing anything by not drinking alcohol or not partying if that makes sense and i'm only gaining so i guess you need to like think about what you want to do and uh, if it's worth it for you and the last question is does glycine increase dht also in my studies glycine seems to be anti-catabolic during calorie restriction have you heard of it So the first part of the question, does glycine increase DHT? There's certainly no human studies finding that, but there is one uh, animal study that I did stumble upon that found that the glycine uh, does increase uh, DHT levels. But again, it's just one study and uh, there's no other human studies about it. So I wouldn't like really, I wouldn't say that glycine is going to have that effect. And you know, whether or not you want to increase DHT depends on your goals, (laughs) if that makes sense. And the second part of the question does glycine reduce muscle catabolism then that is uh, yes the glycine does reduce muscle catabolism or it has anti-catabolic effects so if you are you know severe calorie restriction or if you are fasting then uh, glycine would theoretically also reduce the muscle catabolism in the process all right that's it for this q a if you want to ask me a question then make sure you follow me on instagram at seamlund on that thanks for watching this video stay optimized stay empowered